Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome to Cookville First United Methodist Church. Happy Easter. Easter. It's good to see all of you this morning. Thank you for joining us. It's wonderful to be together. Um, It is Resurrection Day and it's wonderful to share this celebration with you this morning. Um, If you haven't been with us before, a very special welcome to you. We hope that you'll be back. Uh, But we're thankful to be able to celebrate today and we certainly appreciate your willingness to be here with us. There's a lot that's happening in the life of our church always, so I invite you to take a look at the bulletin to see if there might be a place where you would like to be involved. Um, But more than that, we're here to worship today, um, to celebrate God's gifts and the gift of Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead. And so we do that by stepping into celebrating Christ's gifts, Christ's gifts of grace and love and peace. So may the peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to stand and to greet one another in celebration. As we begin our worship time this morning, I would invite you to join me in our opening prayer. Let us pray together. 
Gracious God, we are here to worship. It is Resurrection Day, so as we gather to lift our voices and to be together, we point ourselves toward hope. So speak to us now and stay with us always. Come, Holy Spirit. All the church said. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to Cookville First United Methodist Church on this glorious Easter morning. Let us join our voices in the call to worship. Early on the first day of the week, the disciples of Jesus went to the tomb where he had been buried only to find that the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty. Friends, we gather here as Christ's disciples on the first day of the week to celebrate the good news of the gospel. Tears and weeping will be no more. We will know joy and laughter again. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Rejoice, for Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. 
Let us affirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
we pause to pray this morning, I would always invite you um, to locate the prayer concerns that are listed in your bulletin today. Um, I know that you all have concerns that weigh heavy on your hearts and joys that you might like to lift to God. So I would invite you now just to spend a few brief moments of sacred silence and open your hearts to God in these moments, um, and then I'll pray for all of us. So let's pause and pray now. Gracious God, there is trouble all around us. We are victims of unjust circumstance, targets of all sorts of violence. Our relationships are breaking, our bodies are failing, our expectations are not often met. We are consumed by trouble in the darkest places of life. Our world is hurting. But today is the day we've been waiting for. Today is the day. Today is the day of holy hope, of genuine joy, of freedom through forgiveness, of a life more whole than we ever could have imagined before today. And we are here this morning together to worship, to open our hearts, to say thank you, to find moments of happiness together for he is risen, he is risen indeed, and we have the promise of being made new people. And we pray that you would help us accept that promise. We pray that your promise would be made clear to us more and more every day. That we don't lose ourselves to the troubles of the moment, that, but that we might remember that we have eternal, everlasting hope through the life and death and life again of your son, Jesus. So make any moments where we feel your presence this morning, make that be what defines us after today. Help us stand in the joy and hold on to hope and to be confident in your love. Because today is the day we've been waiting for. Jesus is risen from the grave and our life and all of history has been forever changed. May we know that in our hearts and may it be heard in our words and seen in the very way that we live. Today is the day we've been waiting for. And it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our living Savior, that we now pray together the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite our ushers to come forward as we celebrate God's graciousness through our generosity.
us pray. Lord, our hearts are grateful, and so we give. We give not as a result of fear or out of a sense of only obedience, because we respond to your grace. However these gifts may be used, and wherever we may go, may your love be seen and your story be known. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing. Today's Gospel reading comes from the 20th chapter of John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
beloved and the whole church said Amen. he is risen, he is risen, indeed. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed happy Easter thank you for being here thank you for worshiping with us we welcome those who worship with us by radio and uh, online and it's just good to be drawn together and bound together uh, in Christ our living Lord so happy Easter um, over the last couple of weeks, I went back and reviewed my Easter sermons because I didn't think you wanted a rerun. <laughs> but it's a little bit hard because the story is the same every Easter, okay? It's a little challenging. You know, there's the story. We go to the tomb. The tomb is empty. Huh, what do we make of it? And then beyond. So, I went back and looked so I, I wouldn't, you know, do a rerun. So five years ago, uh, on that first Easter I was with you, I shared with you God's worst case scenario solution. That's what Easter is. God worked all these ways through the Bible to save us and nothing had worked, nothing was working. So he had to send his son to die this sacrificial death on the cross. And he rose again, and he became the cornerstone of this whole new world, whole new life. So God's worst case scenario solution. That was year one. Year two, if you remember, was COVID. And so we, you know, had a spell there where we didn't get to meet in person, but we did gather in the park that Easter. So that year, uh, the sermon was the best morning of all. And it was the best morning of all because we could be together safely. 
Even into the third year, we struggled with COVID. Uh, the passage that year was from the Gospel of Mark, and there are two endings. The first ending, the disciples go to the tomb, and they're confused by it all. They're fearful. They don't know what to make of it. And then you have what's called the second ending of the Gospel of Mark. So that year was the rewriting of the story. Christ, the living Lord, rewrites our story, doesn't he? And so then last year, I shared whistling past the graveyard. Whistling past the graveyard. Um, getting beyond our fear of death and living now in the triumph over the grave. So this year, you know, go back and you look, you don't want to do a rerun. So this year I want to share with you, oh, last year, sorry, was the power to roll a stone. God has the power to roll away any stone in our life. So that was last year. So what to say this year? What to say this year? Hmm. So we came to, we come to the gospel of John, and I noticed how the story unfolds, um, and there are three words. Uh, Mary Magdalene went early in the morning, and she ran away from the tomb, and then Peter and John run to the tomb, and now we live beyond the tomb. So if you want to know, in a nutshell, where we're going here, that's it. From, to, and beyond. So I would just mention, uh, the first year I was here, I probably told the best little Easter story I've ever shared with you, and it bears repeating. So the preacher had the children's sermon, and he asked all the children, what, what do you think the first thing Jesus said after he came out of the tomb? And the little girl went, ooh, ooh, I know, I know, I know, I know. And so he called on her, and he said, all right, what did Jesus say? And she said, ta-da! <laughs> so every year, I have to have you look at this window. Just look at the stained glass window here. It's the resurrected Jesus. And he's saying, ta-da! So I love sharing that. That's the miracle of Easter. It is a miracle. God's power to overcome the grave. The power of sin, evil, and even death. So we're going to talk about that this morning. So what makes a story memorable? What makes a really good story is rhythm. And I've shared this with you before, but any good story has a word or a phrase or an image that repeats. And you, the story unfolds, but you keep coming back to that touchstone of that word, that phrase, that image. Movies particular, a good movie has good rhythm. And so this helps you connect all of the dots in the unfolding plot of the story. So... Um, I know I probably watch too many stories, and I watch old movies, uh, too many movies I, I like. Um, so I would mention just some classic marks of rhythm in some of my favorite movies. They're probably not your favorite movies. Um, I'm old. I like old movies. They're now old. So one of my favorites is Forrest Gump. Do you know the rhythm in Forrest Gump? There, there's two things that create the rhythm in Forrest Gump. The first image of the movie is the last image of the movie, and there's one or two in between. It's a feather floating down on the wind. And if you remember Forrest Gump sitting on that bus stop uh, bench, the feather floats down and lands on his curious George Books. And he puts it in the book. So that the feather is one mark of rhythm in the story. And then what mom always says, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Okay? So that's all through the movie. That's the rhythm of Forrest Gump. Going way back, I don't really like the movie, but it's memorable. Clint Eastwood. You remember Clint Eastwood, his, his phrase in Dirty Harry, go ahead, make my day. Some of you remember that. I think the movie, the greatest movie of all time, of all time, is The Cowboys 
with John Wayne, the Duke. And so the reoccurring um, rhythm in that is he's got this band of boys. He's trying to drive cattle up north with these boys. And so what does he say? We're burning daylight. Let's go, boys. We're burning daylight. That's a really good philosophy to live by. Make every day count. Let's get on the move. So there are others I could share. I reluctantly share one. Uh, you know, it's not a sanctified movie. I'm not recommending the movie. But it has great rhythm. Talladega Nights. <laughs> it's not sanctified. I'm not recommending it. But if you happen to watch it, watch for the rhythm. You know what the rhythm is? Shake and bake. Shake and bake. So, Talladega Nights. So, rhythm. Rhythm. What's the rhythm? So, any good story has this rhythm. So, let's think, what is the rhythm of our life? Well, there's an unfortunate rhythm. And that is our walk, our journey, our experience of having to go to the grave. That's tough. If you think back over your life, I don't know when your very first funeral was or what your imagery or remembrance of that is or what your last one was or anything in between, but all of us take that walk, that solemn walk to the grave. You know, I should have kept records. Uh, someone gave me a journal when I first started in ministry, and I was young and dumb and didn't keep all the records, but the journal wouldn't have held all of the records. But I've gone back and tried to reconstruct. I've probably done somewhere in the neighborhood of between seven and 800 funerals. That's a lot of walks to the grave. When I was young and dumb and just getting started, I didn't fully grasp the gravity of it all. But the longer I lived and the more personal it became, the weight of that trip to the grave began to weigh on me as it weighs on you. And so we all make that march to the grave. You know, it starts, if you've had children or have grandchildren, uh, it starts with them with pets. Pets dying. It's horrible, horrible. Um, we've all been through it. We try various pets to get started. You remember the goldfish, you know, and your children are little. You try not to overwhelm them with the reality of death. So you try to, you know, well, they're just floating on top of the water. You know. <laughs> so, and then you, maybe you go to the toilet and say, well, they need, to, they need to swim in a larger ocean. You don't tell them about the, you know, the water treatment plant. They, you know, bigger, bigger streams. But it's hard to explain death. And you go through all of these pets. We went through goldfish and the hamsters and rabbits. Oh, my goodness, the rabbits. I had two of them. I won't go into the details. It was a horrific death. Um, and dad always has to, you know, come behind. Um, we finally got to dogs, which was all pretty good. Um, but we did have a gerbil. Uh, someone suggested maybe gerbils are a little more hardy than a hamster. You know, our hamsters kept dying. When I was, a, when I was four years old... I have a twin sister and older brother. We all had hamsters, and my brother and sisters, theirs died, and mine was living. And my older brother, Randall, tricked me into taking a clip-on tie in exchange for my one living hamster. <laughs> and so that's how it goes. So we had been through the hamsters and even the rabbit and... So we got this gerbil, and I don't even know where the name came from, but the name was Zippity. Zippity, he kind of zipped around, so somebody came up with Zippity. So we had Zippity the gerbil, and he lasted, you know, several, several weeks. And we loved 
oh, like, you know, the kids would hold him and he would zip around and show the neighbors and everything. So well, we had been through several of these pet deaths. And so I went out one day in the garage and I noticed a little zippity in his uh, cage and he was not well. And so I looked a little closer and I took him out of the cage and he was sweaty all over. He would just, I don't know, I guess the gerbils have fever and he, he would just appear to be dying. And I couldn't stand the thought of having to have another pet funeral. So Zippity was, I thought he was on death's door. So I thought I did what was a humane thing and I carried him through the backyard into the field next door and there was a big field and I thought it was you know far enough from the house and I would just deposit Zippity there and let him just go on to the great uh, gerbil heaven and then I would just come back and tell the kids well maybe Zippity got out or you know whatever so Zippity's cage was empty and we told the kids and they were sad but they didn't have to deal with the actual death okay so I was relieved. I was so greatly relieved, and it was just gross, and you know, put him out in the field. I, I kid you not, we had a resurrection <laughs> gerbil. It was a month later. And I walked out into the garage. I remember it vividly on a Saturday morning, and there was zippity. And I looked at him, and he was all healthy. I guess the field was a better environment. I mean, he was all healthy again. And so I picked him up, and I carried And the kids, zippity! Zippity was the resurrection <laughs> gerbil. So I don't even remember what happened to zippity after that, but um, it was quite the experience for me. Uh, he lives. Zippity lives. So it's just hard. It's hard. It's hard teaching your children about it. There's really no good way to, you know, explain death for a small child. And we just all go through that process of dealing with death. And it gets harder. It gets harder. Um, I did the funeral of a full-term stillborn child. In Memphis and I had two small children at the time and it was tough and I have this vivid image and experience of following the father um, the baby was in a styrofoam coffin and the father carried that child to the grave and I followed him and so that was a tough one. But the irony of it was, the tragic irony was, what I didn't know is that about two years later, I would be taking that same walk as a father with my third child. And so the reality of death begins to set in, and it's difficult, isn't it? I've had some really odd funerals um, I could tell lots of stories at one funeral home a lady planted herself at the opening of the casket and she kept saying ain't that a pretty corpse ain't she pretty she's a pretty corpse and I said to the funeral director please this is horrible can't you move her on somewhere my first wedding became my first funeral I know that's a mind bender the moral of this story is don't let Kevin marry you. Okay. <laughs> but I was 21 years old. I did my first wedding, young couple, and they lived off, you know, two hours away. This was, and it was my first funeral. And I can remember standing at the podium and my knees literally knocked. And so from then on, I mean, seven or 800 funerals. And the thing is, this unfortunate reality, this walk to the grave, gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And we feel the weight of it, don't we? And sometimes we struggle to cope with it. There's an old, one of the first uh, miniseries on television was The Thornbirds. 
And it's a, it's a pretty good little novel. It has a lot of rhythm. But if you remember the story, the heroine is Maggie, or Megan and Maggie. And the rhythm in that story, at least in the miniseries, in terms of imagery, was that they had this family mausoleum. And through all of the ages and stages and generations, the rhythm you would come back to relentlessly was this procession to that graveyard, that mausoleum. And so Maggie is the young heroine, and at a certain point after she begins to lose people in her life and she's overcome with grief, this huge mausoleum with these doors, she pounds on the doors of the grave. And she says to Father Debrickasol, your God is an, a greedy God, a greedy God. And she was losing everyone she loved. So we've lived that, haven't we? And it seems to get harder. And so that's why this morning, on this Easter morning, that's why this miraculous resurrection story of God's action interrupts that procession to the grave. It doesn't stop it, but it interrupts the reality. And as God breaks into our existence and the weightiness of our struggle with death, this march to the grave that we all face, God transforms our reality. He does it by bringing Christ back to life. The resurrection, He rises again. And therefore, that is the cornerstone of our faith because Christ is the cornerstone. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And so what's interesting to see in, the, in John's gospel is that Mary Magdalene, it's the same story every Easter. But this time in John, Mary Magdalene is the first to the tomb in the darkness of the pre-dawn morning. And the stone has been rolled away and the tomb is empty. And so she runs from the grave out of fear, out of anxiety, out of confusion. She runs away from this confusing, harsh reality of the tomb. Even if it's empty, she didn't know what to make of it. We too want to buffer our heart from the hurt of returning again and again and again to that grave. And so she runs away from it. One of the hardest things that all of us deal with is the denial of death. We want to deny it. It's a defense mechanism. This can't be happening. It's one of the stages of grief. And I guess it's how we process things. So the reality for us is that we too run from the grave. We want to avoid it. We don't want to have to deal with it, even though it's a rhythm of our life. And so Mary Magdalene runs from the grave. So she goes back to the disciples and she shares with them this mysterious thing that's happened. So what's so interesting about John's gospel is he gives us such great detail. Incredible detail. So it says, Peter and John take off running. One's ahead of the other. It's as though it's a race to get to the tomb to see what's happened. And so Mary Magdalene runs from the tomb. The disciples run to the tomb. Peter is out ahead and he gets to the tomb. And he doesn't go in. He stoops to look in. He just takes a little peek. But the beloved gospel goes straight into that dark cavern. And it says, John believes, but the rest of them didn't know what to make of it yet. And so they run to the grave. But they don't quite know what to make of it. And so... By now, the first shafts of light are illuminating where Jesus' body had been laid. 
There's a glimmer of belief that something is more. Something more is unfolding. So the good news is that God has defeated death. Jesus is risen, risen indeed. It takes a while, but eventually this whole new reality begins to set in and sink in. It's the rest of the story. Mary ran to the grave and then from it. Peter and John run to the grave and into it. But the rest of the story is how God allows us to live beyond the grave. Everyone say, beyond. beyond. The good news of this morning is that God allows there to be a beyond. That is the resilience of our faith. That is the abiding presence of our hope. In Christ, He lives. And there is a beyond because of God. I frankly don't know how people don't, can face the reality and this rhythm of going to the grave without faith and hope in Christ. It's overwhelming enough. But what I want you to leave with today is the beyond. That's the gift. Beyond the grave is a whole new reality that God creates for us. Beyond the grave is our new rhythm. Beyond. Beyond the grave is what makes our occasional visits there bearable. See, when you carry the faith that you have in Christ and the hope you have in Christ because He is risen, when you carry that with you every day, you live with the assurance of the beyond of God. Beyond the grave is Christ's gift of eternal life. And so as much as we run to and from the grave, God's gift is the gift of beyond. The story doesn't end there. There's more. And so, beyond the grave is now our shared story. One last little movie reference. Do you remember Toy Story? My kids love that. Buzz Lightyear was the space ranger. You remember his motto? It should be ours as Christians. To infinity and beyond. That's the Christian faith. God gives us our beyond. God's gift of beyond can dispel our fear, our deepest loss, and our paralyzing grief. God gives us life unbound by the grave. God gives us life beyond. To God be the glory. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's try that again. Y'all are already thinking about UT basketball. I know it. Some of you are grieving other teams. I'm going to say it one more time. Christ is risen. risen To God be the glory. So as people of faith, as Easter people, carry this faith and hope and love in your heart and life and soul and share it with others. And know that this rhythm, this journey to the grave and beyond is only bearable because God gives us the ultimate beyond. Amen? Amen. We're going to sing our wonderful um, Christ the Lord is risen today. Sing it with enthusiasm and carry with you on this Easter Sunday the glory, the wonder of beyond. Let's stand and sing together.
happy Easter. I hope you experience the full joy of Easter in our life beyond that God gives us through Christ. Receive this blessing and then we'll stand and remain standing and join together in singing. If you'd like to participate, I hope you will, in the Hallelujah Chorus. So let's pray. God, thank you for your most precious gift in Christ, his atoning sacrifice for us. But we thank you most for the continuing story of Easter and beyond. Your gift of faith, hope, and love beyond the grave that is the treasure of our faith you have for us. So may we be an Easter people. Go in peace. Go in strength. Go to live this life of beyond. Amen. Let's sing together.